Are you ready for Duke? Yes. Oh, no, 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 you're not ready. <laughs> Let's pretend you're at a football or basketball game. Duke is leading. Are you ready for Duke? I, I think you might be a little ready. Good morning and welcome to Duke University. My name is Jacqueline Looney and I serve as Senior Associate Dean in the Graduate School. On behalf of the entire graduate community, I congratulate you on your admission to Duke University. A signature of the graduate school is, is its intentional effort in building relationships with students like you. Members of the graduate school staff have been connecting with you since the admissions process and throughout the summer as we were making preparation for you to come to campus. The welcome reception, how many people came to the welcome reception last night? Uh, I think more than that. can't see, yeah, that's good. Well, there was a lot of people at the welcome reception last night. So over the coming weeks and months, we will continue to share communications by email, newsletters, and social media to tell you about future events and, and the many opportunities you have to be involved in the campus community through intellectual and social engagement, leadership, and service. Those of us in the graduate school are here to support you and welcome your thoughts on how we can better meet your needs. Before we proceed with today's program, kindly take a moment to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. Let's do that now. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome those of you joining us from Griffith Theater. We have the largest class of graduate students in Duke's history, so some students may be downstairs. I have the I've had the opportunity to review many of your applications, and I am struck by the diversity of interests, talent, backgrounds, and professional and personal experiences you bring to this community. community. Thank you for giving Duke the opportunity to accompany you on this journey you're about to take. How many of you feeling a little bit overwhelmed and not so sure? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just feel it inside. <laughs> Well, we, we get nervous too, if you're coming, are we doing the right thing? So it's gonna be a very overwhelming week. And one thing that you will learn about me as one of your deans is that I'm very transparent, and I'm gonna tell you the truth. So it's gonna be an overwhelming week, but I think you should just kind of take, pace yourself, get ready for a lot of things to come your way. And when you have that private moment, go to the Duke Gardens or just sit out in, it, it'll be better weather later today, maybe later this week, and just kind of center yourself. The aim of this orientation is to help you in your transition to Duke. Everyone should have an orientation packet. I know some of you have taken a moment to go through that. There's a 20% off coupon for the Duke stores, a 50% off coupon for the Gothic shop, and there's a lunch coupon. So that's most important because we're gonna keep you for a while here and you will be hungry. If you've registered for other workshops during this week, uh, please give yourself time to get there so that, so since you don't know the campus that well and make sure you show up early. And remember, if you show up on time, you're already late. So please show up and if you decide that you can't make it because of other things, please take a moment to go back online and to cancel so we can open up spots for other people. I'd also like to take, also now take out your mobile devices. Alan. And I wanna put up the graduate school's website. That's the website. You see that? Before you call to ask any questions about the graduate school, about anything, please visit the website. Okay? All right, thank you, Alan. You will have the opportunity to ask questions after the faculty and student panels, and the students who are in Griffith Theater will have the opportunity to uh, ask questions as well. Immediately following the orientation seminar is a resource fair where you learn about the extensive support services and resources available at Duke, and that will be in Penn Pavilion, so just follow the signs. If 
you know, so that you won't have to wait in line. Some of you may want to go to the Duke stores to buy some Duke graduate school stuff and show it off. Or you may want to go to the resource fair and come back to pick up your lunch. But there are plenty of lunches available for everyone. So now, and those of you who have completed the appropriate forms will be able to pick up your Duke cards as well. Now, you will hear remarks from the provost and Joe Ray Wright University professor, Dr. Sally Kornbluth, followed by the dean of the graduate school and vice provost for graduate education and professor of political science, Dr. Paula McLean. This session will then proceed as printed with time for questions after each panel. Welcome to Duke University. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, welcome to everyone. I want to warmly welcome you here today for the beginning of your Duke uh, graduate school career. So despite the nervousness that uh, Jackie alluded to, you really are entering one of the most fun, rewarding, exciting, and intellectually stimulating times of your life. You will make lifelong friends. You will learn all sorts of things about yourself and others. And you will, I'm certain, come to love Duke. Now that you're in graduate school, you're basically done taking classes in subjects that may not have interested you. And if you look to your right and to your left, you may actually be sitting next to someone who revels in one of those subjects. And you are forever done being the passive recipient of knowledge being generated by others. In graduate school, you will acquire the tools that will allow you to create new knowledge, to understand things that nobody before you has ever understood. If you're doing a PhD, by the end of the PhD, you will understand your topic better than anyone in the world, probably including your advisor. And along the way, you will hopefully produce enduring scholarship that others will build on in order to understand things that they have never understood. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be entirely easy. When you're doing something new, you often have to go down many tributaries to find the main river. I know from personal experience in the sciences, though this is, I assume, true in all fields, hitting dead ends is the norm. I'd like to tell, I'd like to tell my graduate students that they could do their entire PhD in three weeks if they had actually known all the answers to all of their experiments up front. Now, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but in the laboratory, the physical doing of experiments with a known result is not very time consuming or challenging. Though, uh, as an aside, I will say this does not seem to apply to the undergraduate labs that you may have experienced, where experiments have been done literally hundreds of thousands of times and never seem to work. But in any event, um, it's really the trying of multiple avenues, the testing of multiple hypotheses, and hitting the dead ends that build your scholarly skills. And this is true in all disciplines. You may have an idea that sounds great, but as you play with it, see if your ideas really make sense, as you read and learn more, you may find that the first brilliant idea or the first dozen brilliant ideas don't quite hold water. But in the process, you are learning to be a scholar. Now that may not sound like so much fun, but think about the flip side. When you get that brilliant idea and it actually pans out, I would have to say that's probably the best feeling in the world to have come up with something, to have tested it, or have developed and written about it, and to see it become real. When I was in graduate school, we had this arrangement where our desk sat face to face with another graduate student desk, but we were separated by a very high partition, so you could hear and talk across it, but you couldn't actually see the graduate student on the other side. And one day I was sitting at my desk, and I heard a loud shout, and an expletive, which I won't repeat, but in a good way, um, if you know what I mean, which I'm sure was accompanied by you know, a fist pump, though I couldn't see my fellow student, graduate student at the time. He'd been sitting at his computer, staring at the DNA sequence of a new cancer-causing gene that he had discovered, and he suddenly realized that what he thought was an artifact or an error, it was missing a whole piece of the DNA sequence that, that he had expected it to have, was actually an indication that it was a whole new class of cancer-causing genes, and opened the way not only to his PhD, but to his whole career. He still works on it and is considered a world expert in this class of genes. And I'm sure that he would tell you that this moment was one of the most exciting moments of his life. And I hope such moments await all of you. Almost as important as making great discoveries is the ability to communicate your findings, your insights, and your conclusions to others. You should take every opportunity offered to give talks, to write papers, monographs, reviews, etc., even when it seems like extra work. This is the currency of scholarship, and one of the most important things that you'll learn in graduate school 
is how to convey the excitement of your work to your peers and colleagues, both inside and outside of Duke. I think one of the toughest things about graduate school as you're putting your work, which often feels like your baby, forward is learning to gracefully accept criticism. A central job of your advisor will be to constructively criticize your work, to draw out the very best in your analyses, and to send you back to the drawing board when things just don't look right. Now, different advisors will have different styles. My graduate advisor was a man of great restraint. He would say, mm, perhaps you may want to go and do that experiment differently. Well, my postdoc advisor was more prone to say things like, Sally, that is really one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard. Now, one might argue about the constructive nature of that criticism, but upon reflection, he was often right, and he saved me from wandering down too many dead ends. Another important element of graduate school is the tight bonds you will form with others going through graduate school with you. No matter how much you love your work and your advisor, there will be moments when you want to complain about both, and your fellow graduate students will be the ones who understand your woes the best. This may seem in its most extreme seen in its most extreme form in fields where groups work into the wee hours of the morning, for instance, in laboratory sciences. But even in the more solitary disciplines, you can't underestimate the central importance of discussions with your peers and the sheer moral support you will receive from others going through the same experiences as you. So take some time to really get to know your fellow students. They are the ones who will make your time in graduate school really worthwhile, and they will put you they will put up with you and they will pull you up when you're having difficulties. Now, it will not always be easy for those outside of academia or outside of the graduate school to community to understand what on earth you're doing here. Your close friends and family will likely be proud that you're undertaking a PhD at Duke, but they might not really understand exactly what that entails. And the more esoteric or technical your work, the more that will be the case. I recall very vividly when I was in graduate school trying to explain to my grandmother my work on tumor viruses. At the end of what I thought was an extremely lucid explanation on my part, she looked at me quizzically and said, now let me get this straight. You're not trying to cure cancer in humans, you're trying to give cancer to chickens? And so there you have it. So be patient with those who are near and dear and try to share the excitement of your work and hopefully you'll have better luck than I did. Finally, I want to encourage you to enjoy the ride. I always consider it a worrisome red flag when a new graduate student wants to know in their first, first weeks here when they will finish. I understand that your being here me really means that you want a graduate degree and that you hope that this leads to fulfilling employment, be it inside or outside academia. But thinking mostly of the end game will take away the many pleasures of the ride. And worrying about when or whether you will finish and the time it will take will definitely spoil it. Instead, focus on what you're doing here and now as a graduate student, as it really is a golden time to focus singularly and revel in the work that you love. Well, best of luck, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to cross paths during your time at Duke, so enjoy. Good morning. First, I would like to thank the provost for taking time out of her incredibly busy schedule uh, to address us today. Provost Kornbluth has been involved in graduate education for a very long time at Duke and has been a regular participant when she was on the faculty, on the faculty panel um, of this orientation. She's also been a tremendous partner in our efforts to support graduate students. So Sally, thank you very much. It's indeed my pleasure to welcome you to Duke University and to the Graduate School. Our major goal today, as you have heard, is to provide you with some general information to get you started as graduate students. But as Dean, I also wanted to take the opportunity to personally welcome you and to tell you a little bit about you as a class of incoming graduate students and to talk briefly about the graduate school and about Duke. First, a few words about you, the entering class of 2018. You are the largest entering graduate student class in the history of Duke University, 1,031 students. More than 13,000 prospective students applied to Duke applied to the Duke Graduate School last year. 
Only about 20% of them received offers of admission, and it was even more selective for PhD students, only 13%. You are, your entering class is a highly diverse group of students. 52% of you are studying for the master's and 46% for the PhD. 12% of you are in the humanities, 26% in the social sciences, 14% in basic medical sciences, and 47% in the natural sciences and engineering. About 48% of the entering class are women, and you are a racially and ethnically diverse class. More than half of you are international students, and you represent 54 different countries. And among the US citizens and permanent residents, about 16% are from underrepresented groups and ethnicities. Also, in addition to being diverse, you are truly a very select group of individuals. You are the cream of the crop, and we have great hopes and expectations for you and believe that you can really do this. I believe that you will find you have made a very wise choice to attend graduate school at Duke, echoing Dr. Looney. As you embark on your intellectual journey at Duke, you are not only members of your department, but also members of the graduate school, just as undergraduates are part of Trinity College, graduate students college is the graduate school. So what exactly is the graduate school? We are one of Duke's 10 schools and colleges, and we were established in 1926. We are a school of more than 3,500 students, including about 2,500 PhDs and 1,000 master's students. We are a staff of about 40 people who are dedicated to your education and well-being. We were the ones who shepherded your applications through the admissions process, and we will be the ones issuing your diploma when you complete your degree, and your diploma will read the Graduate School of Duke University. In between those two points, we are your college, your community, your advocates, and part of your support system. We are also the definitive accurate source of information related to graduate study at Duke. Now, I want to reiterate that. The graduate school is the definitive accurate source of information related to graduate study at Duke. Lots of people will tell you lots of different things about what the rules and regulations are, but if you really want to know what they are, come to the graduate school. So once the dust settles and you have questions about a policy or some aspect of graduate student support, come ask us. If we don't know the answer to a particular question, we will connect you with the people who do. The graduate school has a mission to train the next generation of leaders in a wide variety of professions that can effectively use the analytical skills that are gained from research-based training. As we do that, we are also supporting the research and educational missions of 115 programs and more than 1,200 graduate faculty. We also serve as a check on the quality of your experience, both by reviewing our programs and by setting guidelines and policies. I'll mention one specific set of guidelines that you definitely should check out in a moment. We also work hard to provide financial support that allows you to devote as much time as possible to your research and education. As I mentioned earlier, we are your advocates. And one of the things we advocate most strongly for is the need for graduate students to be students and the resources to make that possible. We also make sure you are staying on track academically, and we provide many programs and resources related to graduate student needs, everything from professional development to mental, physical, and social well-being. So I hope you can see that the graduate school is devoted to both your academic and personal welfare, 
and to support the research and educational missions of Duke University. We are all here to help you in any way we can, and I encourage you to contact us when and if you need anything. Next, I want to introduce you to the staff of the Graduate School. These are the people who will be answering your questions when you contact us, and they are also the ones supporting you throughout your time at Duke. As I mentioned, we are a staff of about 40, and we are organized into five offices within the Graduate School. First office is the Office of Graduate Student Affairs, led by Senior Associate Dean Dr. Jacqueline Looney. This office is responsible for organizing this orientation session, the hooding ceremony, lots of other things that happen, and works in many, many ways to enhance the quality of graduate student life by working with individual students, student organizations, and faculty. Graduate Student Affairs provides a broad array of programs on issues related to graduate student life, such as health, safety, housing, mentoring, and professional development. They also work with the Graduate and Professional Student Council, which is the, the official graduate student organization at Duke, and you all will, you will hear from GPSC President Travis Dolwalter in a few minutes. One part of Graduate Student Affairs is the English for International Students program, headed by Assistant Dean Dr. Brad Teague. Many of our international students will interact with Dr. Teague and the program instructors. Shown in this slide are members of the Office of Admissions, led by Associate Dean Anna Lee Richter. These are the folks who processed your application, sent you the good news that you were accepted into Duke, and basically shepherded you through the process until you actually set foot on Duke's campus. The Office of Finance and Administration, led by Associate Dean Shauna Fitzpatrick, who is also the CFO of the Graduate School, manages all the money and financial aid for graduate students. We give out more than 24 million in financial aid every year, and these folks are in control of the money. So even if you've had a bad day, these are the people you really want to be nice to all the time. <laughs> the Office of Academic Affairs, headed by Associate Dean Dr. John Klingensmith, is responsible for all issues academic and for establishing and implementing policies, and houses the Preparing Future Faculty and the Certificate in College Teaching Programs, along with 22 other certificate programs or something. I mean, we just have a lot of things going on. And finally is my office, the Office of the Dean which is staffed by my outstanding assistant, Carlos Walters, as well as folks who oversee the graduate school's HR, IT, communications, and development needs. I mentioned earlier that one of the ways we ensure that you have a great experience is by establishing policies and guidelines. And I want to just take a minute to highlight one set of important guidelines. They are the core expectations of graduate education at Duke University. Just go to the Graduate School website, search for core expectations, and you will find the booklet. Frequently, students will say to me that they are not sure what they should do or what they should expect of faculty. This document answers that question. It outlines the expectations of students, faculty, the university, and the Graduate School. It was developed by a group of dedicated faculty students and staff, and I encourage you to review it now at the beginning of your time of graduate school and to look back on it as your career um, progresses. Now, I've been at Duke since, tw since 2000, and I've been dean of the graduate school since 2012. But as a faculty member in the Department of Political Science, I've graduated eight, maybe nine PhD students now and currently have two that are working with me one that is currently writing her dissertation. And I also have about nine former and current graduate students who work with me on my research still. 
So there's a broad network. In fact, my husband and I were just in Petersburg, Virginia this weekend for the wedding of one of my former PhD students, and there were three in the bridal party that were also part of her graduate school cohort. So I found that Duke is a wonderful place for my students and for me, and it has so many educational and social opportunities. There are so many enriching activities that you can participate in here, and I encourage you to take advantage of them. In particular, I want to draw your attention to a couple of groups that we maintain in the graduate school. If you ever wonder about how you can give input about the graduate student experience at Duke or help make it even better, there are several ways to do it. One is our Graduate Student Affairs Advisory Committee. This is a group of graduate faculty, students, and staff that meet twice a year and communicate over email as needed. They advise the graduate school on student support services, community building between students and faculty, recruitment, and program development. The other group is the Graduate Student Affairs Liaisons. This is a group of graduate students from across programs who help us strengthen our relationship with departments. They help communicate about graduate student resources and events through word of mouth. They also bring back to the graduate school the needs and concerns of students in their departments. This group also volunteers for our events like this orientation, recruitment, uh, graduate Student Appreciation Week and graduation. And of course, if you just have an idea or suggestion that, um, about your experience that you can share with us, feel free to drop us a line. A number of the programs that we've developed over the years have come directly out of students talking to us to say, I think we need something like this. That's exactly how our childcare subsidies uh, came about. Beyond the graduate school, there are over 100 student groups that exist at Duke that have a mission related to graduate students. Take advantage of them and all that Duke has to offer. If you want to get involved and you do not know how, visit the graduate school website or contact the graduate school about how to get involved. Check out the Duke website for a calendar of daily events. The choices are endless. Take time to explore what Duke has to offer. It will enrich your experience as graduate students. I also encourage you to venture beyond the walls of Duke and to get to know Durham. This is a fabulous city with a diverse population that is filled with academics, artists, multiple theater and music performances, um, number of venues, a New York Times recognized foodie town, a, we have a wonderful AAA baseball team, the Durham Bulls. If you've never seen AAA ball, it really is an experience. I think it's the Marlins. It's a farm team for the Marlins. I think that's who our team is. Uh, and other sports events. So there's more than just basketball um, for you to enjoy in terms, in terms of sports. And like I say, Durham is just an amazing, an amazing town. In closing, I should say that all of you, no matter what your discipline, will be asking, will be asked to think in new ways, to be creative, and to participate in a community of scholars that will inevitably open your mind to new ideas. The opportunities, challenges, and fun times that you will have here will be unique and defining in your life. I would like to wrap up by thanking the Office of Graduate Student Affairs and then all the staff of the Graduate School for organizing all of our welcoming events for you. But finally, let me reiterate that we at the Graduate School are here to help you and to provide you with the highest quality education. Do not hesitate to let us know how we can help. And I want to leave you with something I heard a couple of years ago about Duke University from Michael Schoenfeld, who's Vice President for Communications. And what Michael said at that time is that every day, somewhere on campus, someone knows something that they did not know the day before. This is the essence of the beauty of the intellectual environment in which you are entering. On behalf of everyone in the graduate school, I wish to extend our most sincere welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you the very best of luck.
Good morning. My name is John Klingen Smith. I'm the academic dean of the graduate school. And I want to reiterate what Deans Looney and McLean and Provost Kornbluth said. We're really absolutely thrilled that you're here. We've been looking forward to this day for a while. And I also want to say that I know that what you're about to confront is difficult. You don't know what exactly to expect. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about just for the next 15 minutes or so. What to expect and how to, how to behave. You know, kind of what we're expecting from you and what you need to do to be successful. But I want to first point out that I know that you can be successful because literally I have been involved in the review of applications for every single department, master's and PhD, in the graduate school. And I know that the decisions that were made by the admissions committee and by the graduate school were taken very seriously. Every one of you is absolutely qualified to be here. We're truly confident that you can be very successful. I know that there's a phenomenon called imposter syndrome that many of you might feel that, hmm, I'm not really sure I belong here. I look around the people in my program, they also seem, they seem so smart and accomplished. I'm not sure I'm in that league. We know that you are in that league. Every one of you belong here, and you can be successful. And that's why I want to give you a little bit of operating parameters to help you get there. And mostly I want to talk about the, the three areas where, as the academic dean, I see that students, if they're going to have a problem, that it most likely occurs, namely research expectations, the academic expectations, and the behavioral expectations that we have for you. And let's see, there we go. So Dean McLean already alluded to a document which I would reiterate is really useful for you to look at. Uh, it, the website is here for this. It's our core expectations document, and it outlines the expectations that you can have and that we can have of graduate faculty, so faculty members. Also the expectations for graduate programs, the programs in which you are a student, as well as the expectations of the graduate school itself. But the most relevant, arguably most important part of that document, certainly for our purposes today, is the expectations of you as students. So I would really spend some time looking at this, because this is what we're expecting you to be able to do. And in particular, I want to highlight research expectations. Uh, research expectations are a little bit less clear than the academic expectations that we'll talk about in a moment, because things like grades are pretty straightforward. It's more difficult to know if you're performing adequately with research. So here's just in you know, three bullet points kind of what we're expecting. Namely, that you work responsibly toward the completion of your degree, whatever degree it is, in a timely fashion. And so there are time limits for all of the degrees that we have. Uh, typically, a master's degree is completed within two years. The maximum possible is four. Typically, a PhD has various milestones. The preliminary exam must happen by the end of the third year. The dissertation exam is expected within two years after that. And the absolute max is eight years. So we would expect you to make progress on that schedule. And one of the best ways to know how you're doing is to be in regular communication with the director of graduate studies in your program and with the faculty with whom you're working. They're the people on the ground who are going to be determining whether you're meeting expectations or not. And so it's really useful to be in discussion with them just to kind of help you get feedback about how you're doing. And finally, we truly hold all students to exercise the highest level of integrity in their research activities as well as other activities that they undertake here at Duke. And I would especially emphasize that this relates to research in a way that's a little bit different from academics because as I say, and we'll see in a moment, with academics it's a little bit easier to evaluate whether a student's had a violation of integrity standards. With research, we're talking about issues such as collecting, analyzing, presenting research data. And so a lot of this has to be at the level of your own vigilance to make sure that what you're doing really is uh, of the highest standards and consulting with your group, your advisor, other faculty in your program to make sure that they agree. Now, in addition to research expectations, all of you are involved in one way or another in research, whether you're a master's or a PhD. All of you also will be involved in more straightforward academics such as taking such as taking courses and various other activities. Let me tell you what some of the operating guidelines are there. First of all, 
it's very important that you do not get an F, because if you get an F, then uh, we'll probably be having an awkward discussion about your pending dismissal, uh, which is never fun, but just be aware that you need to get a passing grade in all the courses that you undertake. In many programs, you can't get less than a B minus to be in good academic standing. In all programs, you have to maintain a grade, a grade point average, a cumulative grade point average of at least a 3.0, which is a B average, to be in good academic standing. If you have a semester where you go below that, it doesn't mean that you're dismissed, but it does mean that you would then be on what we call academic probation, which means that you're kind of uh, on notice that your performance has to improve to be off of academic probation. And then once your GPA comes back up and your performance overall comes back up, then you're free and clear to continue. All of the programs have requirements in addition to coursework, and you are required to participate effectively in those. For example, many programs for PhD students have teaching as part of the education that, and training that you're getting as an emerging scholar in the area. And so in that case, it would be important that you take your teaching assistance ships seriously. Similarly, for PhD students and many master's students, you'll perform as research assistants, you'll be uh, working with professors on research projects. It's similarly important that you take your research assistantship responsibilities very seriously. If there's required seminars or seminars that you're expected to attend, then similarly, it's necessary that you do so. As I mentioned, there are schedules for masters as well as PhDs. I already alluded to these, but it's important that you meet these requirements on schedule. In addition, in many programs, you might be expected to take a certain course by a certain time. So for example, maybe all students have to have taken an introductory uh, economics course by the end of the first year. Those kinds of requirements are very important to be clear about. And there again, it's a great example of how if you're not clear, then check with your faculty advisors or director of graduate studies to make sure you understand. And finally, and this is the most difficult to assess on your own, is that you have to make satisfactory progress toward the degree. That's not only in terms of things like courses, but it's also in terms of research projects. So making progress on your master's thesis, for example, or making progress on your dissertation project if you're a PhD student. Again, it's difficult for you to know what satisfactory progress is, so therefore it's really important to get faculty feedback on this. The other thing that's critical that you do is to uphold the Duke community standard. All of you have already agreed by the very act of accepting admission to Duke. You've already agreed to do this. And so, in case you didn't actually read the fine print, I'll take you through that now. Duke University is a community dedicated to scholarship, leadership, and service, and to the principles of honesty, fairness, respect, and accountability. Citizens of this community, students as well as others, Commit to reflect upon and uphold these principles in all academic and non-academic endeavors. I would emphasize and non-academic endeavors. And to protect and promote a culture of integrity. To uphold the community standard, you'll not lie, cheat, or steal in any of your academic endeavors. You'll conduct yourself honorably in all your endeavors, and you'll act if the standard is compromised. And just to give you some more specific examples, of prohibited activities, really just illustrations of what I've just said with specific examples. I won't read you what these things are, but just to point out that we expressly prohibit lying, cheating, theft, harassment, sexual misconduct, assault, trespassing, I'm not done yet, Possession of illicit drugs on university property or as part of any university activity, whether on campus or not. Refusal, uh, possession of explosives, incendiary devices, or firearms on university property. Refusal to comply with the directions of a university police officer. Uh, you know, I know that these things seem like a lot of forbidden activities and surely you as a fantastic graduate student prospect would never do any of these things, but I do have to say I've I've had cases of violations of every single one of these. So bad things do happen to good people. Please just try hard to avoid them. I also need to make you aware of some university-wide policies about activities. I'll just mention this website here, web.duke.edu policies 
uh, for students that are university-wide. You can look at these yourself. But if you have any questions about, you know, for example, um, pickets, protests, demonstrations, what's allowed, what's not, that's a good example. You might want to refer to a website like this. And as you probably guessed, there are some consequences to violating these things. I hate to be too heavy-handed, but I do need to tell you what the consequences would be. First, among academic consequences, grade reduction, failing grades, probation, I mentioned that, suspension, dismissal, working on one of those today, uh, withholding of the degree, even retraction of the degree, retrospectively if necessary. But there's also non-academic consequences of violating these things, such as required training, restitution, restrictions, probation again, suspension, dismissal, civil prosecution, and if you're an international student, deportation from the U.S. So there's a lot to consider here, but, but why focus on the negative? Let's spin that a little bit more positively. <laughs> because, yes, some bad things could happen if you violate these, but you're not going to. I'm sure that you have no intention to, and almost all of you won't. And so let's think about the rewards. First of all, if you're successful, you're going to get a graduate school degree from Duke University, and you're sitting here today because you know how valuable and important that is, or you wouldn't be here. And you are right, so congratulations for making a wise choice. There'll also be the perception among the people in your field, and really the, the world, that you're a person of integrity, and that you have deep skills and expertise in the area in which you're trained. And that's something that we work very hard to ensure that all of our graduates have. And all that's great because it leads to the respect of your peers. Here's a student with a couple of uh, her advisors. You can see they're just proud as punch that she got her, that's uh, a student who got her PhD last May. Very happy going on to a great job. She's got the respect of her advisors, the peers, everyone in her field. And you know, these things lead to jobs. And just to, to illustrate that a little bit, I wanna draw your attention to, this is my last slide, a project that we work very hard on to illustrate to you and the world how successful Duke students are at getting jobs when they are graduates of the graduate school. This is just one little snapshot from a website that we have uh, on program statistics that you might want to look at. We have various ways of looking at what the career outcomes are for jobs. This one illustrates PhDs and where those jobs are located currently around the globe, and you can see that we have successful PhDs who have gotten jobs all, literally all over the world, uh, especially in North America. And you know, a few, few big focuses in the, in the United States as well. Uh, you can look at what kind of jobs they get, like by uh, employment sector. Uh, you can look at in academia, what sort of jobs do academics get. Anything you want, and these data will be available for master's students within the next couple weeks as well. So I want you, in a few years, to be one of the data points that's on a slide like this, and I want for Dean McLean and Dean Looney and I to be congratulating you if you're a PhD student as you cross the stage to get your hooding, or if you're a, a thesis student that we're certifying you for graduation in the Academic Affairs Office at the Graduate School. So here's to your success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dean Klingensmith and Dean McLean. And now, your leader, the Graduate and Professional Student Council President, Travis Dewalter. Travis is a PhD student in public policy. I thought for sure I was gonna fall up those stairs this morning. Um, good morning, thanks Dean Looney. I'm Travis Dewalter and this year I'll serve you as the President of the Graduate and Professional Student Council. I've only had five minutes with you today, uh, and there's no way that I can cover everything. Um, so if you have questions or you want to learn more, we'll have a table at the resource fair. We'll be there all day. Um, I think the times are 1230 to 2. So GPSC is your representative body. We work with the administration to improve our student experience, and we also, as an organization, provide services that will make your time here more enjoyable. This includes hosting student life events like bar crawls and tailgates and hikes through nearby national parks. And we also set up volunteer events so that you can give back to our local community. Camp out for basketball tickets starts September 14th. 
And this is an amazing event and the one time when all of the graduate professional students, all of them come together as one big and kind of smelly community. Um, <laughs> If you are interested in learning more about how you can go to a Duke basketball game, then stop by the basketball committee table, which will also be at the resource fair today. And I want to briefly talk about this newsletter bullet that's up on the screen there. We send out a weekly newsletter, which is meant to share with you the services that GPSC provides, as well as advertise the upcoming events. There is going to be a time in September where you feel like this newsletter is cluttering up your inbox and you're going to unsubscribe. But you should know that for whatever reason, the system we use to send out the newsletter simply resubscribes you and sends out the email so you're gonna get it no matter what. <laughs> Instead of immediately deleting it, treat it like a two minute trail. Take two minutes, familiarize yourself with uh, events that are coming up, remind yourself of the services that GPSC provides, and then delete it. Another one will be hitting your inbox in a week and you can do the same thing. Now, where I want you, uh, to spend the meat of this presentation is on these underlined bullets you see on the screen, advocacy and resources. And let's start with advocacy. I think part of advocating on local and national issues starts with activating the electorate. And the GPSC Advocacy Committee collaborates closely with the nonprofit You Can Vote. If you aren't registered to vote in North Carolina, or you want to learn how, or you want to understand what issues are on the ballot in November, then please see the You Can Vote booth at the Resource Fair this afternoon. You can also go to the website sites.duke.edu slash dukevotes. And now let's talk about resources. GPSC offers three major resources that I want you all to know about. And these resources are here to make your lives easier, so please use them. The first is the Community Pantry, which we have located at the GPSC house in Central Campus. There might be a time in the next few years where you wonder where you're gonna get the money to pay for your next meal. GPSC has your back. Come to the community pantry and pick up whatever you need. If you'd like to get in and out of there quicker, consider signing up for our weekly bag program. You'll go online to our survey, you'll order the things that you want, we build a bag for you, and then you just swing by the house to pick it up. You're in and out, it's very easy. We also have something called the Lawyer Assistance Program. Starting August 27th and for every Monday for the rest of the school year, there is a lawyer that will be sitting in a room for three hours from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. and all he, wants you to, all he wants to do is help solve your legal problems. Maybe you're trying to understand if you've been wronged or you need help pleading down a speeding ticket. These are binds that are distracting to our studies and, we need, uh, or, and this program is designed to move you past that. So please, if you need uh, help with the Lawyer Assistance Program or you'd like a legal counsel to look over one of your situations, go to our website and sign up for one of those 15-minute um, uh, time slots in his office hours on Mondays. Finally, even when you budget for everything, unexpected emergencies can still turn your finances upside down. The Emergency Travel Fund was designed to help you get to wherever you need to be during times of medical emergencies or uh, bereavement. We can't pay for all of your travel, but we hope we can make it just a little bit easier for you. Check out the website for more details on this program and how you can apply. And many of you might be wondering how you can get involved with the Graduate Professional Student Council. Whether you want to rep uh, represent your department as a voting member of the General Assembly or you'd like to join us at one of our community service events, find what works for you. And if you have any interests, Come by our table at the resource fair today and talk to me about it. We'll find a good, uh, a good way to get you engaged with uh, GPSC and with your graduate professional community. You can also go to our website, sites.duke.edu slash GPSC, also available by email. Uh, let me know how I can help you. Thank you very much for your time. Good luck this year and welcome to Duke. My name is Melissa Bostrom, and I am Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development. Today marks a new segment in your professional development journey. 
You may have come to graduate school to develop technical skills or disciplinary mastery, or gain a credential that would qualify you for an advanced career path. Perhaps you were driven here by your motivation to contribute new knowledge to the world store. Your graduate school experience at Duke can undoubtedly help you meet those goals. What you will also find is a rich environment for professional development that complements the disciplinary knowledge you'll gain and better prepare you to launch your career after graduation. Whether you're a master's student or entering a PhD program, the opportunities for employment you face after you graduate are many and broad. If you're a master's student, you'll find an employment market that increasingly seeks the specialized knowledge of a graduate degree. For doctoral students, research has demonstrated that increasing numbers of PhDs find employment opportunities outside the traditional tenure track, from around 80% uh, for biomedical sciences PhDs to about 50% among humanities PhDs. The Graduate School follows and publishes the PhD career outcomes on our website, as Dean Kling and Smith showed you. So if you're interested, you might be able to learn that the top employer of PhD alumni outside the academy is Google. Um, and as Dean Kling and Smith mentioned, master students, you'll be able to see data for our master's alumni in September. The graduate school supports you in pursuing career paths, whether in academia or in government, industry, nonprofit, or as an entrepreneur starting your own business. We want you to find a satisfying professional life in which your job responsibilities align not only with your knowledge and skills, but also with your interests and your values. You'll find that at the graduate school, we celebrate our alumni success stories and all the ways that our alumni leverage the research skills they developed in their graduate programs to create knowledge in the service of society. In your time at Duke, whether that's one year or five, you'll have the opportunity to take advantage of outstanding resources to grow and practice your transferable skills. You'll find events sponsored by the graduate school and our campus partners, including the Duke Career Center, conveniently located in one place on the Graduate School's professional development calendar. You'll receive an email from my office each week highlighting upcoming professional development events and opportunities. So a quick note, if you forward your Duke email to another address, like a Gmail address, please make sure to mark that email address, grad-profdev at duke.edu, a trusted sender so that you will find out about these opportunities. No matter what your degree, program, or career goals, you will find opportunities to grow in professional development here. Master students, you will find a workshop series focused on communication, self-awareness, and leadership, transferable skills that will be in demand whether you plan to launch a professional career immediately upon graduation or pursue further education. PhD students, you will be the first incoming class to use Duke Options, an online professional development planning tool that helps you identify ways to develop six important competencies and map out your professional development activities over your five years at Duke. So you can actually use this tool to identify opportunities and create a plan throughout your PhD program. Research suggests that graduate students who engage in professional development may speed their time to degree. So speaking to Provost Kornblue's remarks, students who ask how long will it be before I graduate, well, you can make that timeline faster by engaging in professional development. So PhD students, you can start planning your future today at options.duke.edu. In addition to opportunities tailored to your degree goal, you'll find discipline-specific opportunities on campus. Students in STEM disciplines will find a number of events of interest offered through our partnership with the Office of Postdoctoral Services. Students in the humanities and interpretive social sciences can take advantage of a unique initiative called Versatile Humanists at Duke. For more, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Maria LaMonica Wisdom, who is Director of Graduate Student Advising and Engagement for the Humanities. <laughs> I have one slide. 
Good morning, and, and welcome to Duke Graduate School. My name is Maria LaMonica Wisdom. In my role as Director of Graduate Student Advising and Engagement in the Humanities, I provide customized advising and coaching support to humanities doctoral students at all stages of their PhD programs. I also run an NEH-funded program, Versatile Humanists at Duke, that provides internships and other funding opportunities for humanities doctoral students and works to build a vibrant, interdisciplinary community of emerging scholars, teachers, and professionals. There are well over 400 doctoral students across Duke who identify as scholars of the humanities and the humanistic social sciences, which we include history, cultural anthropology, and so forth. If you are enrolled in a PhD program such as English, Romance Studies, Literature, Classics, History, Religion, hang on. I'm coming to your department to speak with you shortly, and in fact, perhaps I may already have. However, you may be a qualitative scholar working in a field not normally associated with the humanities. Perhaps you are in sociology, psychology, public policy, or another field. Your research grapples with how human beings make sense of their existence. Perhaps you even call yourself a humanist. If this sounds like you, you'll want to know about Versatile Humanists at Duke and how we can help support your academic and professional growth. Look for me at the resource fair immediately after orientation, and I'll be delighted to speak with you. Thanks, and best of luck as you launch your doctoral studies. Thank you, Maria. No matter what your discipline, you can start your professional development today by using powerful networking and career research tools like LinkedIn and the Duke Alumni Network. I encourage you to take advantage of this week to create or enhance your LinkedIn profile so that you can add new connections as you meet them here in Durham and around the triangle, building your professional network. I also encourage you to leverage Duke's tens of thousands of engaged alumni who really want to connect with students and help them. Um, engage them through the Duke Alumni Network as you explore your career options and look for ways to gain experience. In your folders, you'll find a handout with a guide to the Graduate School's professional development opportunities, where you can learn more about the programs and resources we provide. The Graduate School and our partners are committed to helping you identify your career goals and achieve them through our professional development offerings. I look forward to seeing you often through the next year or five as you take advantage of all that Duke University offers. But rather than telling you about those opportunities myself, I'd like to turn things over to your colleagues to share their perspectives. Many different professional development opportunities here in the graduate school. We're a little bit of an alphabet soup in terms of our offerings. This is Duke University. I am in the CCT program, which is the Certificate in College Teaching. The Preparing Future Faculty program. Behind the scenes with the when I was in um, undergrad, I didn't take advantage at all of career services, right. any any of that. And I thought getting a job was Eli. easy. I thought you just you know you have a degree, you, you apply for the job, and then you get job it. interview, uh, how to write cover letters. I mean, the horrible thing for me when I write is that blank page where there's nothing. I mean, how will I go from nothing to something? The certificate in college teaching is for graduate students who either want to pursue a career that involves teaching, like a faculty position, or some other career path uh, where those skills would be useful and transferable to their career. We first started out just doing an introduction and then eventually you build to a 30-minute group presentation where you're teaching the class. That's not really, you know, time intensive, but I gained a lot from these programs. We wanted to do a little bit of an investigation into this idea of the culture of academia and specifically kind of the realities of graduate students and postdocs thinking about options in non-academic versus the traditional academic careers. One of the unique things about Duke, we attract a wide range of students some of whom want to be in a research environment, others who may want to return to a small liberal arts college. I think one of the common mistakes that I see people doing is that uh, they're 
get sort of in a single-minded mindset uh, where they're not sure exactly uh, how to explore other options or what the process is or who to talk to. Given the realities of the academic job market, given the realities of today's economy, you need to start thinking ahead and you need to take advantage of the myriad of resources that Duke has. We have to be ahead of the curve and we have to think about are those opportunities for our students just in teaching? Are those opportunities just in research? As a career counselor, I always tell the folks that I'm working with, for me, it doesn't matter where you go. You can go into an academic career field, you can go outside of academia. I just want you to find something that is meaningful to you. We understand that students may come into graduate school with one idea of what they want that professional career to be, but over the two to five to seven years that they're here, that idea is gonna change and evolve as they change and evolve and mature. Okay, so for advice, um, don't, don't be that grad student with your nose stuck to the grindstone. Uh, take a moment to look around, um, remember why you're there. Try not to lose the forest for the trees. Find a balance in your life as soon as you get here. It's not enough just to do, do a PhD and write a dissertation. Try to figure out why you're here. Lift your head from the bench every so often. Be more open and make more contacts with people. If you allow it to change you, it will do so radically. Everybody's in this process together. Just meet with them and talk with them. Start early. Start as soon as you can. As early as possible. From day one. Your professional development for you must begin today. As soon as possible. Mrs. Jones was washing up on a Sunday afternoon. While the father and son were playing with the video in the other room She thinks of when she was younger and the dreams that she forgot I like changing the world and living a life a little different than the one she got This is Duke University When I was in undergrad I didn't take advantage at all of career services, any, any of that, and I thought getting a job was easy. I thought you just, you know, you have a degree, you, you apply for the job, and then you get it. So many of us, like PhD students, we're just like stuck in the grind. We just kind of say, okay, I'm in it, I gotta finish my doctorate. And then you finish your doctorate, you look around, and you're like, oh, now what? Well, I guess I'll go to a postdoc, right? Because that's the next, that's the next line. We actually have so Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, great. So now we've got the first of two, two panels. I'm not sure where we're getting feedback here. We've got, the, we've got the first of two panels. This one's a faculty panel. Then we'll have a student panel. And in both cases, it's an opportunity for people who have been around Duke for a few years, whether as a faculty member or as a, or as a graduate student, to give you their perspectives on how to be successful as a graduate student, specifically at Duke. And I'll just introduce the faculty panel after just saying a few words about myself, just so you have a sense of the diversity of faculty members we have here on the stage. I'm a professor in the medical school, specifically in cell biology and in pediatrics. I'm interested in developmental genetics of, of mammalian 
organisms, including humans, and how that knowledge can be used for therapeutic purposes. Um, I'll introduce my colleagues here in order as much as I can. Uh, Fan Lee, she's here somewhere. There she is. She's an associate professor of statistics. Uh, all of my colleagues have multiple appointments. I'll just give you their primary appointment because we'd be here all day reading their many <laughs> titles. Um, uh, Fan's interest is uh, her main research interest in statistical methodology and causal inference. She also has a strong interest in statistical methods for big and complex data. And one of the things I liked is she also works on missing data. You should have worked with some of my former students. <laughs> uh, yeah, so statistics. We also have John Dolbo sitting here to fans right. He's a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. Uh, John's research concerns the development of computational methods for nonlinear problems in solid mechanics. And we have Kerry Haney from the Department of Political Science, where he's an associate professor. Uh, Professor Haney's research and teaching interests are in race and ethnic politics, intersections of race and gender, legislative processes, state-level politics, southern politics, and comparative urban politics. Sounds like he's a busy guy. <laughs> and then finally, we have Joseph Winters, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies. And his interests lie in African-American religious thought, religion and critical theory, African-American literature, and continental philosophy. So you can see that we have quite a spectrum of academic perspectives represented on the stage. And we're providing that so that collectively we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions, we hope. And we've asked each one of the panelists to just spend a few minutes giving their sort of points of wisdom, uh, words of advice on how you might approach graduate school to be successful. Pam, would you like to start? Sure. Please. Uh, no. <laughs> Hi everyone. I, I was here last last year and I already forgot what I said. So <laughs> so I actually have five minutes. I think two minutes would do. Um, so I think the first thing um, is work hard. So you you hear a lot of things. It's, you see all these videos. It look all nice. So people get nice jobs and all that kind of thing. Uh, the most important thing in graduate school is work hard. Um, because as you, as you start to work, you realize graduate school is really, the, the time is really a, um, almost a prestige. It probably will be the last time in your life you can have really allocate, um, you know, two years to five years, really sit down and study a subject or field. And this is very precious as you get, the, get a job whether it's in academia or industry, you will get very busy. You will not have that time. Even though I, I try to sit in some classes uh, still, <laughs> but it's very hard to do. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, yeah, have fun. <laughs> so study is, uh, there's no conflict between these two. I, I think the have fun at the same time being open, I think one of the, the video, uh, particularly if you're an international student, I feel that you, um, uh, one important thing is uh, really to be open to the culture and to the new um, the, the campus, the university, the, your student, and then particularly to the new culture. And uh, again, if this is your first time uh, in U.S., first time studying U.S., I recommend you immediately go to buy a TV and then, uh, you know, watch politics or watch news, even though it's a little bit depressing these days. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's important actually to know what's going on in this country, what is going on in the society. It's not just your books. I mean, I, I say work hard, but also you also need to play harder. Um, so I think the last thing is uh, uh, be your own advocate. Um, again, there's a lot of resource in this, in this campus. A lot of people are willing to help, but I see a lot of students, they are so immersed in their study, um, they just forgot to seek help. Uh, particularly if you, when you have trouble, you know, all sorts of troubles. Um, it, it can be in academia, it can be uh, social life, and you will run into some roadblocks, and uh, in this kind of situation, uh, you should know that there are always people there in the graduate school, also in your department, uh, who are helpful. So uh, don't uh, be hesitant to, uh, to seek help, and also be your own advocate, essentially. You, you also need to 
you know, make sure that you seek all the opportunities that are available to you. So I think that's, that's my perspective. So my name is um, John Dalbo, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in front of all of you today. So when I was in grad school, uh, I was sitting where you were, where all of you are, in front of a faculty panel. But it was at, towards the end of my graduate career instead of the beginning. And one of the members of the faculty said that, you know, there are many people who would like to stay in graduate school forever. And I found that comment very curious because I certainly didn't know any of them. <laughs> Now, over time, I've come to appreciate that, in fact, that faculty member was correct. There are people who would like to have stayed in graduate school forever. Um, they're known as faculty. <laughs> <laughs> and part of that is certainly nostalgia, um, but there is a grain of truth to that that I think is very important, and it's been mentioned by several people today, and it's really the luxury of time. Okay, this is really the only time that you're going to have really after, the, after your time in graduate school, you're not going to have an opportunity to really fully immerse yourself in a subject. And I hope that you'll appreciate it sometime before you leave just what a luxury that is and that you'll take advantage of it. So I just have a, a few other nuggets of wisdom to share that I think other people have commented on as well. Over the course of your time here, you'll have mentors um, and you'll have professional relationships and I hope that you'll have, most of you will have many mentors. And like any professional, like any relationship, um, professional relationships that you have with your mentors take work. So make sure that you invest the time in developing those relationships and fostering them. In my experience, when students in the programs have difficulties, it's often due to a communication breakdown between them and their advisor. So to the extent that you can get to know your advisors, get to know your mentors, I think that will make a tremendous difference in your success in graduate school. So you have an opportunity here to become, genuinely become scholars during your time in, in graduate school. And I would just encourage you to think about that in slightly different ways. When you have, for example, a class that you're taking and you're looking at this, the course syllabus, to view that as a suggestion and not a recipe. To take the opportunity to explore the topic broadly, to, to seek out texts that are different from the ones the faculty member is recommending or the instructor is recommending and to really immerse yourself in the subject, to go beyond the syllabus. So I'd also encourage you to stretch, your, to stretch yourself. So I think a lot of you can look at the range of opportunities that have been presented uh, this morning and just be overwhelmed and decide that you're going to commit yourself fully and completely to working in your lab or your research group and your courses, fully immersed in those, and never really stray beyond. And you can do that and you'll be successful but you'll have missed out on a lot that Duke has to offer, and Durham as well. So even if you just take an hour or two each week to do something a little bit different outside of the ordinary, it's not much time, but I think you'll get a lot out of that. So it could be attending a seminar that's outside of your area, picking up a journal that's outside of your area, or just one that's in your area that you just haven't had a chance to read, attending a play in this theater, okay, something a little bit different. Just take that opportunity, I think you'll, it will enhance your experience significantly. Finally, I'll, I'll say for, for those of you, uh, students in the STEM areas, um, the irony of your career after you leave Duke is that your success is largely going to be rate limited by your ability to, to effectively communicate. So you have an opportunity while you're here, writing is a skill, it's a muscle, it needs to be exercised to work effectively. Make sure that even though you're working on very technical areas, that you take the time to really become as proficient a writer as a communicator as you can be. That's all I have. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kerry Haney, uh, professor in political science and African and African American studies. Um, the first thing I want to offer and suggest to you uh, is that you take care of yourself. Self-care is extremely important uh, for whatever you do, and especially in this business, uh, self-care. So whatever that is for you, uh, please take care of yourself. If it's music, sports, quiet time, 
friends, cooking like me, I cook. Uh, Self-care is extremely important. And take care of one another. Uh, Duke has a wide range of services and facilities uh, in this regard. Uh, you saw some of those uh, in the slides this morning. Uh, please, please take advantage of these services. Uh, your studies are important. Your career is important. But you have to take care of yourself for those other things to then fall in place. So self-care, self-care, self-care. Uh, do something every day, every week to take care uh, of yourself. Second, I would like to offer uh, this suggestion, networking. You've heard quite a bit about networking. Uh, I like Dean Klinger Smith's uh, maps that he put up. Uh, traveling around the globe, uh, almost always run into a dookie somewhere. And that's important when you are in faraway places uh, in terms of connections to ease a transition into a place or to make one's experience in that place uh, much more beneficial. Uh, and you, want, you will soon be uh, depicted on the map and a place that we can suggest others who are traveling about uh, as a person of contact uh, for our students and alums. Uh, so network, get to know one another. Step outside of your own department, uh, your own schools, uh, and, and meet other graduate students and undergraduates and faculty, for that matter, uh, in other areas. Uh, the Duke family uh, is a rich uh, and growing family, uh, quite generous and hospitable family, uh, and you now are a part of the Duke network. Uh, another a bit of advice, and this may sound uh, a bit odd, given that this is the first couple of days that you're at Duke, Start thinking about how you're going to give back. How you're going to give back. Um, you know, one of the things that we're all lucky uh, to be doing what we do as faculty members. And when I think, and I often think about, that someone paid for me to do this, right? I had some fellowship or some aid uh, for me uh, to do this. Uh, and that's a luxury. Uh, my friends who, my contemporaries, were working uh, real labor, as I call it, even though we get into these debates, what we do is hard labor as well, not put up what we do against anything else. Uh, but think about how to give back and start thinking now. And you can give back in a number of ways. Uh, but someone made it possible for all of us to do what we do and for you to be in this room, in this situation. Uh, so it's not too soon to start thinking about how to contribute back uh, to the graduate school and to Duke University as you plot your career using the wonderful services now that uh, Duke has to offer a broad range of planning services. Uh, and finally, I will say, explore Durham uh, and, uh, and North Carolina. Uh, Durham is a wonderful uh, community, and we're lucky uh, to be situated in a, a place like Durham. Um, Durham is often studied uh, by social scientists and uh, folks in the uh, medical and biological sciences. One of the unique things about Durham and distinctive things about Durham, that Durham has a stratification, a uh, racial and ethnic stratification, a class stratification, that many of us pay a lot of money for samples <laughs> to sort of fit uh, uh, our models. Uh, so Durham is a quite an interesting place, uh, deep, rich history. Uh, the Duke family's history in Durham is interesting. Uh, Durham is a, is a wonderful place to explore. Uh, so get out uh, outside of campus, uh, get into the community, get to know Durham and, and folks who live in Durham and the, in the wider region. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Winters, uh, Assistant Professor in Religious Studies and African, African American Studies. Um, I guess because of my last name, I always have the dubious advantage of going last on these panels. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to just sum up what, what's already been said. Um, first, I want to say congratulations. I might be the last person to tell you this. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But first, I want to say congratulations right, um, on being here. Um, as you face obstacles, these first couple of years, and you will, right? Remember that you've been selected, right, from, from a wide, talented pool of, of, of individuals, right? So congratulations on being accepted into various uh, departments and programs. 
So I guess I just want to kind of sum up a, a, a kind of a, a recurring theme, which is balance, right, which I think is really important. Um, one, one type of balance is the balance between, right, you know, being situated in your particular department, which is obviously really important, getting to know the people in your department, professors, uh, fellow students, but also venturing out, right, taking, court, uh, taking classes in other departments, meeting people in other departments. Um, I think one of the things about Duke is very, one of the possibilities at Duke, one of its richness, uh, part of its richness is a possibility of interdisciplinary, right, um, um, kind of classes. Um, second, um, I know, you know, most of us, ha we, when you come into a program, you have a certain research project, right, in mind. I mean, that's good, right? You want to have some kind of structure, but you also want to be open to possibilities, right? You want to be open to other research possibilities, other ideas, right? Maybe expanding on what you thought your research project was. Um, I think uh, another balance, another side of balance is, again, the relationship between work and play. Um, don't spend all your time in the university, right, doing the academic work. Find rituals outside, right, outside of the university, spiritual, religious, right, exercise, right. You mentioned food, right, the Raleigh-Durham area is, I think, surprisingly for some people, a very rich kind of, has a rich food culture. Um, binge watching, <laughs> right, I'm not, and don't be ashamed about it, right, like binge watching, like, like insecure or this is us, or whatever, right, I mean, don't, right, that time is important. Right? And I would suggest it's a spiritual ritual. We can talk about that another time. Right? Um, I think, fine. I think as other people have talked about, I mean, the RTP area itself, right? I mean, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, there's just rich possibilities, right? Arts, right? Politics, activism, music, right? The Art of Cool Festival is coming here in about a month. Right? I think there's just a lot of possibilities. So I would definitely, right, encourage you to check that out. But also we encourage you to, like, leave this area when you, if you can, right? Go to other places, right? It's family, friends. Um, so I just think that the key theme here is balance. Um, and again, congratulations, and I wish you the best in your first, as you embark on your first year. Thank you. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, maybe about 10 or so. And this is an opportunity for you to ask, before you get too deep into your studies, very knowledgeable faculty. One thing I didn't say is that all of these people have deep experience in graduate education. Um, some of them have been directors of graduate studies in their departments and for their programs. So there's a lot of expertise here, and this is a chance to ask questions of faculty in a sort of an anonymous way, because we don't even know your names yet. We also can't really see any of you, <laughs> by the way, so. You can't see anyway. Any questions? Free t-shirt to the first person who asked a question. And it says Duke Graduate School, so it's a good t-shirt. Oh. Paper part of graduate school. Paper part of graduate school. Joseph's the most recent. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, well. Um, doesn't seem like, yeah. I think my favorite part of grad school is also something that I regret <laughs> in some way, but I mean, I'll explain it, right? My favorite part of grad school was that I was around so many amazing people, right? But I think because I got so, sometimes so caught up in a tunnel vision, I didn't take the time to, to, to learn more about those, those people around me, right, and develop those relationships. But I, I mean, I think just, I met not just amazing people, not just who were really smart and brilliant, but just the experience that they had, right, even before they came to, um, came to grad school, right? Um, and many of them I stay in touch with, right? Usually through our, through our academic conferences, right? But I would just say the kind of lasting relationships that I made would be the one thing. You know, quickly, one of, for me it was building relationships with uh, faculty and mentors. Uh, the program I attended, uh, and just like, I think it's the philosophy at Duke, that we see you as faculty and colleagues to be. Uh, so that building those relationships and learning how to uh, become a faculty member and to act and present myself as a faculty member. So those relationships were extremely important. And uh, when I look back, one of my most favorite times was building those relationships and engaging faculty. Um, it's not a lot different for me. I, I was very fortunate to be in a research group that um, was very productive. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of success. and. Um, I was very fortunate to work with some exceptionally talented people and to develop relationships with them that have carried on to the present day. 
Um, and so looking back for me, it was a very special time. I'm, I'm really not sure I really appreciated uh, how special it was at the time, but in retrospect, um, I really value that time as a PhD student. Well, I echo all what's said, uh, what has been said, but uh, for me, it's really the fellowship of the ring. <laughs> it's facing my fellow friends, uh, fellow students, and I really, uh, many of them are really brilliant people, and uh, I made uh, lifelong friends with them, and uh, uh, till today, and uh, I think some of you might get lucky and even find your future spouses in graduate school, and that's not bad. I, I don't think I can top that, so. <laughs> it is true, I, a, a number of my graduate students, I've had about 15 PhD students graduate from my lab, and literally there were several pairs that found each other during orientation week, so cross your fingers. <laughs> okay, any other questions? You can see that this, this panel is quite happy to speak up. Oh, that's a good one for me. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is one sort of shaking experience. In the uh, first semester of my graduate program, I, and I came with a master's uh, to my PhD program, and I, I wrote a paper for this class and the professor passed the paper back after a couple of days, and it said words to the effect, this is the best you can do, you should think about doing something else. <laughs> uh, that, that was quite shaking in, to get in the first couple of weeks of, of a graduate program. Uh, and I mentioned earlier about building relations with faculty, and I stayed in contact with that faculty member, uh, who recently, he, he sort of followed me to do, had a career another university, retired, came back to the area here and, and, and was in political science for uh, several years. And he heard me tell that story and he said, was that me? <laughs> Damn right, you know it was you. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he said to me, and, and this is the, the story, he said to me, I'm glad you took the message as I intended it when I wrote those comments. That to step back, take a look, and I didn't fold up and go home. Uh, it, was, it was harsh. And it, and it shook me, as you say, it was shaking, but he and I engaged on that uh, topic in that paper, and here I am. I guess I'll, I'll suggest one. So in my case, it's a little bit related to what Provost Cornbooth was talking about. So I also was a bio, biological scientist as a graduate student. And in my case, I remember working really, really long hours when I was maybe a second or third year student to try to get a particular experimental system going. And being extremely frustrated because it seemed like no matter how diligent I was, no matter how many hours I worked, just keep banging at it, the experiment didn't seem to be working. And I got very frustrated. I even thought, do I belong in graduate school? I can't even get this experiment to work. I was so frustrated. And I met with my advisor about it and you know we, we poured over the data, we're trying to figure out well, what's going wrong and, and he realized before I did that what I thought was a failure was actually a success. Mm -hmm. It just was not at all what we were expecting. And it's because it has to do with the experimental system but knowing retrospectively, retroactively what was going on, the results should have been variable in exactly the way they were because we were dealing with a, a kind of mutation that depended on the circumstances that the organism was in. And so that, once we figured that out, and really it was my advisor more than me who did, that very quickly led to my first publication. Mm. So I was able to have a paper after two and a half years in graduate school from what I thought was a failure. It actually really turned out to be a, a great thing. And then I realized that, you know, especially in research, failure is not always what it seems to be. Sometimes understanding what the failure is leads to the insights that you need to move your field forward. Any other comments? Oh, we have another question. Hi. Um, so you mentioned looking into areas outside of your field. So what's the best way to approach people in those other areas? Or how as faculty members do you like to be approached about your research? So, so it might depend on, right, the department that you're in, the field you're in. But when one thing to think about is a lot of courses are cross-listed, at least in the, in the humanities. A lot of courses are cross-listed, right? So you might think, you might see a course in your field, 
but the professor's kind of main, right, main location is, is um, or position is in, a, is in another department. Um, so if, if it's, you know, a course that's maybe not cross-listed, that but that resonates with some of your research interests, sometimes it's just good to just email, right? Sometimes it's just good to email, um, or even just kind of go to the, the first class and talk to the professor about, like, your interests and the possibility of working with them in the future and so forth. <clears throat> And I would add uh, the Graduate and Professional Students Association, your association, uh, the newsletter that you would get that you won't delete. I don't think. Uh, take advantage of opportunities and things that you will see announced there and social events, right? So chatting with someone in a social event, you may realize that you have some intersecting uh, and complementary interests that may not meet the eye, but in the course of conversation, that could pop out. I would like to mention that Professor Dolbo in particular is a professor of like five different things. So <laughs> I want to hear his perspective on related to this question. How do you bridge departments if, you're, if your interests are, don't fit neatly into a particular department? So, so I will say that I think um, one of the really special things about Duke is um, just how open the faculty here are about talking about their research to just about anyone, whether it's people in their own department, their research group, or people outside of that. And so it sounds a little bit um, contrived, but I really do think that if you spend the time trying to learn about what a faculty member here is doing, what a research group is doing, um, invest some time on your own to come up to speed, and then just email that person and, and tell them that, hey, you know, you read the, this paper, you thought it was really interesting, or you saw something on their website that, that kind of captivated your imagination. My guess is that actually the, the vast majority of people are going to be interested in speaking with you and just you know hearing hearing what your thoughts thoughts are on on what they're doing. So it's a you know I, I think by and large um, I mean I'm very happy here I, I can't it's very difficult for me to imagine working anyplace else and you know I, I hope um, that you start to appreciate that you really are in a, in a special place and the environment here is a very very healthy one and encouraging one around students, around scholarship, around interdisciplinary discussions. And I don't think you should be shy about approaching uh, faculty that are uh, outside of your department, outside of your area. I think you'll be surprised by how open the response you'll typically get. Time for a couple more questions. There's one way back there. Um, hi. Uh, I want to ask, would you recommend developing personal relationships with your advisor and faculties in addition to the professional relationships, or do you think it's a horrible idea and it should be avoided? Well, I just want to say it depends on how personal. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is a good time to say that there is specific prohibition against romantic relationships between <laughs> faculty and students. But certainly it's good to know your advisor on a level more than just a completely uh, formal relationship in the context of advising. It's, you know, it's nice to know a little bit about the person's background and thinking. It will help you understand their perspectives more and also bring richness to your, to your interactions. And most faculty are open to that, as long as we keep it professional. What do you say is the most challenging aspect of You know, I, I will say time management. Uh, so, you know, and that's the other thing that was certainly for me, and I see it with some of my students, uh, that you're your own boss in, in, in many respects as to deciding, you know, when to work and how much time to put in. So figuring out how to have the balance uh, and to work at a, on a pace and at a schedule that's productive and effective. I think related to that um, is the reality that you, as, a, as a graduate student here, whether you're a master's student or a PhD student, you're going to have some choices. And it can be difficult at the time to try to, to have confidence in yourself that the choices that you're making are the right ones at the time. But I would just try to reassure you that they probably are. Right? The choices that you make are probably the right ones at the time. But the challenge is to, to, to get through that process, to make choices and have confidence in your decisions.
Time for one more question, and then we'll let the students take over. I think, I think the question was what made us pursue a PhD degree? You know, so <laughs> for, for me, I mean, and, and, I, and I still say this when I, I talk to prospective graduate students and undergraduates about what we do. Uh, I know of no other profession that allows me to pick and choose my work. Uh, and so I choose the things I think about and write about. Uh, I choose pretty much the classes that I teach and I even get to choose pretty much when I teach them, what days and what hours of the day that I teach. So I get to organize my work life uh, in a way that works for me and suits my personality and, and my life. Uh, and that's a tremendous luxury. Uh, and I realized that in graduate school that I had this opportunity uh, and this was the path I wanted to be on, it worked for me. I ended up being a PhD in, I had a PhD in spouse statistics. It, it was accident, but the, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it, it's accident that I ended up being spouse statistics or versus statistics or mathematics. But uh, that was the only way I, I knew, I, I like it. I really like uh, doing research. I, 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 like, I like it and I still like it. And I think that's the uh, random pass work out really well for me. And I hope that you, one day you find something that always fascinates you as much as you know my subjects that fascinate me. So it's really luxury, and I still enjoy it. Pretty much the same for me. I, I caught the research bug as an undergraduate. I was very fortunate to have had that opportunity, um, and it just stuck, and it has stuck uh, for quite some time. Excellent. Thank you oh. so much. Thank you, faculty panelists. So I do promise that lunch cometh, <laughs> but it is so comforting to look out this morning to see some already familiar faces from the welcome event. They don't let me all the time have all the hot dogs and hamburgers that I can eat. So I look forward to the, this time each and every year where we can pull out the grill and you and I can eat together. Let me take this opportunity to personally welcome you to your newest citizenship, the graduate school, and to your new extended family, those seated around you. Our task this morning is to start you off with tools and information for success in graduate school. Now this morning, five of your graduate school colleagues will share her or his wisdom as Duke graduate students. First, we have Sophie Wolf Galson. What an humble soul. Now, Sophie was lurking in our coffers as a master's student, but let me tell you something. She wrote me and said, look, Dean Kendrick, I graduated from graduate school in May, but I would love to be on the panel. I couldn't turn that down. Sophie has earned both an MD and a Master of Science in Global Health from Duke. She is currently faculty in the Department of Surgery, Division of Medicine, and her research focuses on hypertension and linkage to care in Moshi, Tanzania. Now, by show of hands, how many of you are Master of Science in Global Health students here? Take advantage. I want you to meet Sophie because she is a great resource. Her favorite movie is The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Dr. Sophie Wolf-Galson. 
Next, we have Sinya Coopers, who will begin her second year as a PhD student in classical studies. Her research focuses on the blending of genres and literary styles in Greek and Latin poetry. Another show of hands, how many of you are first generation graduate students? Awesome. Sinya will be establishing a graduate student group for first generation graduate students, so be on the lookout for that. And the graduate school looks forward to assisting you with this effort. We will meet soon, Sinya, so thank you. Sinya's favorite movie, The Intouchables, that's I-N-T-O-U-C-H-A-B-L-E-S. Renzi Arthur Ma. Now, Arthur is his English given name. Renzi is a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Chemistry. He studies analytical chemistry in drug mode of action discovery. Most recently, Renzi was president of the Duke Chinese Students and Scholars Association, which is one of our most active student groups supported by the graduate school. They meet international students at the airport and escort them to campus. Now, if I were going to study abroad, I would surely want a group like this to be at the institution that I was attending. They do so much more than that, and I encourage you all to keep up the good work. Renzi's favorite movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Nice. A third year PhD student in political science, my discipline, Elliot Mamet. Elliot's interests are in political theory as well as American political development. Delving deeper, Elliot researches American political thought, prisons, and democratic judgment. Now, if you have strong feelings this morning about the US judicial system, talk to Elliot. If you like musicals, his favorite movie is West Side Story, Elliot Mamet. And we have Melissa Minto a second year PhD student in computational biology and bioinformatics. She recently joined the West Lab in neurobiology and her research focuses on exploring the epigenetic changes that occur during neuronal development. Did I get that right? Yes. Awesome. Her favorite movie, Finding Nemo. Her words, don't judge me. <laughs> Melissa Minto. Now, as your peers come to you to offer wonderful advice, let me leave you with a thought attributed to personal coach Cheryl Richardson. Quote, the possibility for rich relationships exists all around you. You simply have to open your eyes, open your mouth, and most importantly, open your heart. I encourage you to be open to learning, to be open to shifting your location, to get another perspective. Be open to the resources available to you and around you so that you can turn those times of uncertainty into the times of assurance. Best wishes to you this academic year and in the years to come. Take it away, Sophie. Thank you, Dean Kendrick. I'm honored to be here today to give you a few bits of wisdom, and I hope you can learn from my experiences and my mistakes. I remember sitting in this auditorium two years ago when I was starting the master's program. I looked around me at the faces of my fellow students, and I had a feeling that I had never had before. It was a completely new sensation. I looked at my fellow students, and I felt old. So if anyone is having that sentiment, know that you are not alone. Um, I have three pieces of advice to share with you today. The first is socialize. The second is to use your resources. And the third is basketball. I'm going to go through each of them. So in terms of socializing, I was reading uh, the New York Times this Sunday. I had the day off, part of the whole balance thing. And I was reading an article actually about thriving in college. And there was a quote from a guidance counselor at the other institution uh, in the triangle, UNC. And he said, to paraphrase, one of the greatest purposes of higher education is to increase the number of human souls that knows you and cares about you. And some of you may have more lofty, less egotistical ambitions for your time here, but I do think there's a great deal of truth to that statement. So make an effort to connect with students, especially those who are different from you. In my case, 
This was students who I felt were from a whole different generation. They actually ended up teaching me a lot about how to use social media, how to give visually appealing presentations, and how to have a more um, idealistic worldview. Secondly, um, use your resources here at Duke. If you're into research, this includes things like statistical support, database management, um, dictation software, if you hate to type like me, and there are a multitude of grants available to you for any idea or skill set you want to obtain. There is an internal Duke grant that can meet that need. Personally, I do research in Tanzania, and I was having trouble communicating with my research team, so I applied for a small grant to learn Swahili. This greatly enhanced my experience, and honestly, the quality of my data was much improved after this. Um, on a more somber note, I work as Dean Kendrick said, in the emergency department here at Duke. And I unfortunately see many uh, graduate students who are having difficulties coping with realities of life. It's normal to feel anxious and depressed at some point during your graduate school career. There are many free resources available to you through the GAPS program, so please take advantage of those early and often. Um, Finally, basketball. I hope I'm not the first one to say this, but as a graduate student, you can go to games for free. You will not be able to sit. You probably will not be able to move your arms, but you will have an amazing time. And this is what truly made me feel at home in the Duke community. So thank you all for having me. Um, I wish you the best of luck. I hope to meet some of you on campus and hopefully see none of you in the emergency department. Also for me, a warm welcome to all new graduate students to Duke University. I first of all want to say um, I really had a hard time settling in last year when I came to Durham because uh, I'm an international student and had to set up things like internet, um, getting the energy uh, running and uh, getting a mobile number, which is really hard being in the US without having a mobile number. So if you're still struggling with this or that's in the back of your head, um, Go and reach out to the International House. They are a lovely team and they're happy to help you and assist you with settling in successfully at Durham. So I want to share some of my experiences um, with professional development on campus that I really benefited from. First, my first um, experience was going to lunches and dinners um, with students from diverse disciplines and just learning how they organize their daily work, what their plans for the uh, coming academic year are. So you're going to spend a lot of time in your departmental bubble and it's a great idea uh, to reach out and do a little bit of social networking, getting an idea what interdisciplinary projects are there and um, just making bonds with people outside your department. The other kinds of events I went to during the last year um, were designed by the graduate school to advance your research specifically, like how to be a strategic dissertator, how to commence writing your thesis and keep the ball rolling. So these were really helpful for me to hear people speak about their experiences, people who are about to complete their dissertation or have already done so, and what challenges they ran into. And when it's your time to write your thesis up, um, you might find that you're equipped with a set of skills that help you navigate these situations. So I do recommend going to these events and you find them at, uh, advertised in the newsletter, like the Versatile Humanist newsletter we already heard about. Um, you also find in this newsletter internships, grants, and fellowships advertised you can apply for. One of these internships I um, took advantage of was an internship already established at the National Humanities Center that's also located here in North Carolina. And I really prospered there and um, felt blessed to get to know to the people there that are working there, faculty and students, and was working in a group with students from four different universities and uh, college teachers on space, time, and movement, and looking at how to apply geographic information systems to teaching classical studies, in my case, and see how other people, what their ideas were, and how they approached the matter. That was, again, very helpful, doing some social networking, in this case, and reaching out um, in my studies and with my research. Um, what I surely benefited from most of all was to have the professional development grant 
with another student of mine in the classical studies because we both had a vision for quite a while and we wanted to get all PhD students and master students who are the first in their families to go to graduate school and see that there is some resource for them. Um, we wanted to have first generation graduate students gather at a symposium which did take place last, uh, last April and share their experiences, their common experiences. And also we invited a professor from the University of Alabama to talk about her research in higher education as social scientist and have give a little career session and how to be a successful academic and also how to be successful outside of academia if you're a first generation student. How to be a strategic planner, for example, um, that many students struggle with when they're from first generation background. We were very much um, struck by the positive feedback we got and we're already trying to get a second follow-up symposium running with UNC, with the neighboring university um, next April and you're very much welcome to sign up for that. Um, one of the panelists I invited to talk about her personal experiences during that symposium and I decided to move forward and take this beautiful experience we had there um, by creating a student organization called Duke Firsts. And you might have already seen a flyer lying outside. We're having our kickoff lunch next week at about the same time at the graduate school um, at 11.30 to 12.30 in room 102. You just need to sign up and register for it online. If you Google Duke first, you will find our website. We're also on Facebook and we have a website um, connected, affiliated with the Duke Graduate School. Our guest will be Dr. Melissa Bostrom, and she will also tell you a little bit more about how to get involved with the Duke Graduate School. Some of our events will also target um, the issue of how to communicate your research successfully, how to survive Thanksgiving, for example, when you're seeing your family and uh, as uh, Provost Sally Kornbluth uh, pointed out, you try to convey the message and what you're doing um, and trying to get the idea across the table, right? Or how to communicate your research to people outside of your discipline. How to do small talk. We are hoping to get uh, speed dating with advisors and faculty uh, running this academic year. Um, and this will certainly also help you with interviews when you're going to uh, conduct interviews or be in an interview situation later on. Um, you can also talk to Natalie and me at the Duke Resource Fair. We've, we're at table 17, and I hope to see you at some of the events of Duke first. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Rinzi, uh, known uh, for my friends as Arthur, and uh, I'm a fourth year chemistry student. Uh, welcome you guys to the Duke community. And when I was thinking about uh, what I should talk about today, last night, the first question coming to my mind is that, um, you may also have this question is that, what's the difference between the undergraduate school and the graduate school? My PI also, always answer this question by the undergraduate school is somewhere you learn the, the, you learn the knowledge generated by others, and the graduate school is somewhere you generate not new knowledge. I thought he made it up him, himself, but uh, today I finally realized it's echoing of our provost, Sally, uh, in her speech. Um, so speaking of generating new knowledge, um, there's one thing that you cannot avoid, that is failure. Um, believe me, the graduate school, the Duke graduate school is somewhere that failure does not make so big a consequences as in some other places. So um, you should embrace this uh, opportunity to failure and also success. And sometimes um, the failure and success, it's a, there is a blur, um, Order between these two. As mentioned actually in uh, Dr. Uh, Clint Smith in his story that sometimes failure is actually a success but you actually don't know it. It actually happened a lot of times in my research too. Um, so the one thing um, when you're trying to um, get familiar with graduate school is that um, there is a lot of failure and there is more, in more occasionally there is a success for your academic study. And speaking, a part of academic study, uh, speaking of uh, your uh, life at Duke, there is uh, also new knowledge generated in this uh, Duke community uh, to yourself. 
Um, there are a lot of opportunities that you can take. For me, um, I was never actually um, taking any opportunities to be as some like um, our cadre in the class or some in, in the China. Uh, you're familiar with something called the uh, class monitor or something like that, a banjiao kind of thing. Um, but when the opportunity come to me that uh, there is the uh, president of the Duke Chinese Students and Scholars Association, I think to myself that uh, the president, oh, whoa, that's cool. So why not take the opportunity to, like, um, to learn how to do it? So then I uh, was, then I actually finished my term as the president of Duke Chinese Students and Scholars Association, know, of, uh, many, know to all many of you as DCSSA um, for last year. And speaking of DCSSA, there um, like we provide a lot of surveys uh, to our Chinese students, or also non-Chinese students at Duke. Um, we picked up actually 400 students from the airport last year. We haven't got any statistics back for this year, but I believe uh, we have same similar um, number of students picked up to the um, from the RDU airport uh, to Duke this year, and that cannot. Uh, we cannot thank him enough for the graduate school, especially Dr. Kendrick, and also the GPSC. Thank you, Travis. Um, so there is opportunities for you to try many different things like um, you have never tried before in the uh, Duke graduate school or part of my academic life. As one of our uh, Duke alumni, Tim Cook, uh, speak in the uh, graduate comments in this year, he said, be fearless. And that's actually um, what a uh, uh, mindset that you want to have in graduate school, that you can try a lot of different things and forget about the success and forget about failure, forget about the good life, the uh, bad life, and the ugly life. It's always your life in Duke. Thanks. Welcome to Duke. I have a few, uh, I have three pieces of advice to offer today. First, you're about to embark on an adventure of exciting proportion. If I could give one word of advice for you as you begin your voyage, it would be this. Know that your worth as a person is more than the vicissitudes of life as a graduate student. You are more, much more than your identity as a Duke graduate student. You're also a partner or sibling, child or parent, musician or volunteer, a person with talents, hopes, experiences, and passions outside what can at times feel like the narrow path of academia. Know yourself. Your graduate student status at Duke is but a piece of the person you are and compartmentalizing your graduate training versus all the other parts of your life can be a useful tool for success in graduate school. Second, graduate school can strain your mental health. I found my time in graduate school to be exhilarating and full of intellectual pleasure, but at other times grueling, extremely stressful, and unexpectedly much more mentally taxing than anything I've gone through before. The evidence bears this out. A recent study in the journal Nature Biotechnology found that graduate students are more than six times as likely to experience depression and anxiety as compared to the general population. Let that sink in. Uh, e echoing Sophia, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to pay attention to your mental health and to seek out help when needed. Duke has a terrific counseling center located in the Student Wellness Center, which is available for graduate students. It offers individual and group counseling sessions as well as classes like mindfulness, yoga, guided meditation, and more. As well, do things outside of graduate school. Uh, picnic in the Duke Gardens or walk the Albuler Trail. If you have a car, visit the extraordinary North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh or drive to the beach in Wilmington. If you don't have a car, take the free bus to visit our neighbors at UNC Chapel Hill, go on a Durham history walking tour, visit the farmer's market, or echoing Dean McLean's advice, cheer on the Durham Bulls. Learn how to swim, 
read poetry, cook, join a sports team, or attend an arts class. Do things that bring you joy. Unrelated extracurriculars allow you to feel valued outside of your graduate student life, and they're crucially important for success in graduate school. Thirdly, to echo Professor Haney, be a force for good. In a 1968 sermon delivered only two months before his death, Martin Luther King spoke of what he called the drum major instinct, an ambition to lead, to be first, to find success ahead of others. This instinct, King thought, was an inevitable part of our being, but he also thought that each of us could harness that instinct for good. Each of us here in this room, I suspect, have a bit of a drum major instinct inside of ourselves, aspirations, goals, and aim to succeed. My last piece of advice then is to think about the ways in which your ambitions and talents can be used not only in the pursuit of truth for truth's sake, but also to seek justice, to do right, to bind the wounds of your communities, speak out about inequity, improve the institutions around you, Volunteer, vote, be a good and informed citizen. Use your graduate training to be a drum major for justice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Melissa Minto. As he mentioned, I am a second year PhD student in computational biology. And let me tell you, this first year, flew by. Like, I remember when I was starting and I was, I had all these concepts that I wanted to get a good grasp on that I had said to myself, there's no way I'm going to learn this. I cannot grasp these concepts. But standing here today saying that I moderately know these concepts now. It's only my first year. Um, things like Monte Carlo Markov chain modeling, computer networking, and um, chromatin accessibility sequencing. I've gain quite a bit of knowledge on those things. Um, I'm saying this to say that the knowledge, it will come. It's a part of the graduate school experience and the design of your programs to get the knowledge. But what takes more effort and more um, work is building up your confidence, building up the relationships around you, um, and just improving yourself personally outside of the knowledge of grad school. So, I want to give some advice to you guys. Um, firstly, take advantage of all of the social events in, that your program has to offer. I didn't do this my first semester, and I felt myself having imposter syndrome or feeling kind of isolated. But once I started getting out there more, I noticed that making friends and t regularly talking about my issues or you know what I'm working on with my peers was very helpful to me, not only just gaining their knowledge, but sharing my knowledge and feeling like I'm on the same playing field as everyone else. Also, the people around you in your cohort, they're gonna be your colleagues for 20, 30, 40 years, so you should probably get to know them, make good with them, don't be mean to them. <laughs> um, next, I wanna add that you should probably step outside of your comfort zone um, and explore things way outside of your field. For me, I did this with art. I'm not an artist. I'm not good at art. Maybe it looks like abstract art a little bit. Um, but art is something for me that I completely have to focus on and, you know, kind of lose um, my focus around everything else just to put my effort into it. And it helps me to break my, you know, hamster wheel back here, always thinking about my project or how can I fix my analysis. And it helps me just dwell into something that is completely different from what I'm doing on a day to day basis. So find something that, you know, could help distract you from, you know, your wheels always turning in your brain and um, to just help you to have a more well-rounded um, perspective, and also to just take a break. Studies have shown that that will actually help you to be more focused and driven in your studies. Lastly, I want to say that you know yourself best. 
If you feel uncomfortable or you, you know, something seems off in a situation, maybe there's a requirement in your program that you don't feel that is quite applicable to you, be your own advocate. Go to your professors, go to your advisors, the you know, top people in your program, and speak to them about it. Tell them how you feel. Most often than not, they're going to be willing to make changes and be amenable to how you're feeling. And um, it will be more rewarding to go and advocate for yourself and fight for what you think is best for you and your PhD journey rather than to suffer through something that doesn't seem to fit what you need to be doing. So y'all made it here. Y'all at Duke. I know that y'all are going to do well academically, but please put in the effort to do some um, self-improvement. Um, um, during your time here, focus on building your soft skills, finding a hobby that's distracting but not too distracting, and um, be your strongest advocate. Thank you. I'm going to ear to ear because I am impressed. Give it up for your colleagues one more time. <laughs> Lunch cometh, but we want to take questions from the audience, from you. So if there are questions at this time. We actually have a question from the Griffith Theater, our remote viewing location. So if panel, if you want to give them a wave so they see you, They're, you're on camera. Great. <laughs> this is the question. Given the recent anniversary of the violence at Charlottesville and the defacement and removal of the Robert Lee statue from the Chapel Plaza, this person's interested to know how you feel Duke has begun investigating its historical roots and how we as graduate students can learn about that history and begin to participate in the conversation. I think each of us here are attending a school uh, in a region and in a country at a time of flux. Uh, I mean, if, if you all have been paying attention to news, just last night at uh, UNC uh, uh, made international news for, for the removal of the Confederate statue uh, that was at the middle of that campus. Uh, there's a lot happening here at Duke regarding these issues of, of uh, race and history uh, and our own responsibility. Um, there uh, was a symposium in the spring uh, on this topic. There was a uh, campus-wide committee that, that issued a report on this topic, and there's going to be more ways to be involved. So uh, I, I would say from my perspective, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something uh, that you should keep your eyes open about for opportunities to get involved that Duke from the, from the, from the top leadership all the way down is, is interested in addressing this question and that as a citizen of the university and of this region, it's, it's uh, uh, incumbent upon us to, to, to think about these questions and to act about them. Um, so, so, they'll, so keep your eyes open for opportunities to engage on these issues. and. Um, it's certainly going to be a feature of, of your time at Duke that, that this is the place you, you live and work and a member of the community, and these are, these are issues that the campus is facing. Um, I would like to add that um, the new president of Duke, if you, he sends out emails, you know, sometimes you should read those, and you will see from those emails that there are, you know, actions that are being taken um, for these issues and also ways to be involved. But it also sends a good tone of how um, much they're willing and open to listen to our, the students' concerns. And if you have an issue similar to that or not similar, it's, it seems very easy to you know make your voice heard and have that issue being taken seriously. So as a Duke student and as a black Duke student, I have yet to feel that I can't voice my opinion about something about race or discrimination, my gender. So just keep that in mind that this is a very open and welcoming um, environment in terms of that. Other questions? One 
One right here, Maria. So for me, the most important thing is registering and voting. Anyone can do that with very minimal amount of free time. I also engage a great deal with the community through my clinical work in the emergency department. And I get to meet citizens from all aspects of life. So that's personally how I do it uh, with a minimal amount of time. But it's something everyone needs to come up with on their own. Um, for me, I'm, I'm more of an introvert, so uh, finding those opportunities can seem a little bit harder for introverts, but there are meetups and group meetings and different Duke clubs and organizations that, you know, just take the time to look at things around the community that you might be interested in, and it'll be worth your while to at least check some of those things out once, and yeah, like someone was saying, in being involved in Durham things and not just do things really helped me to feel more valued as a person because it kind of gave my identity, um, or broadened my identity from just being a Duke grad student. So I definitely recommend doing something like that. Um, for me, I think um, it's more of uh, um, like going out to meet other community and listen to how other people feel and how other people think of things. Um, if you stay in your own community for a long time, you are like kind of restricted of your feeling that um, because everybody is uh, have the same feeling with you. So it's more about uh, talking to different people and hear from them. Yeah, for me it was partly um, seeing which events are offered in the region. Um, for example, I went to a great puppet show in Saksapaha, a, a location I could never have pronounced uh, last year, certainly. Um, also to see um, what institutions are around here, like the National Humanities Center, or to reach out to people at UNC and try to do projects together with other students at other institutions, or um, for example, in the CCP program, in the Certificate for College Teaching, you go and visit other institutions and see how other people teach and learn and um, meet other people around the university. Uh, all I would add is that um, the history of Durham and this region and the state is so fascinating and these great questions about race and uh, class and um, uh, uh, the American ideal and immigration and industry are all reflected in that history. And so any ways in which you can learn about this place, whether it's through um, uh, scholarship, some, some of which is, is being done here at Duke, or whether it's uh, vi visiting museums, or um, uh, uh, going to Greensboro to the Civil Rights Museum, or, or the, there's a Durham History Museum, a uh, very fine North Carolina History Museum. I think learning about the history is, is one way of being a good, a good citizen, and uh, s something I've enjoyed as I've been here. Hi. Um, uh, looking back on your experience, I guess either inside or outside of the graduate school, um, is there anything you'd regret or something you do differently? Um, for me, I would say uh, I regret I didn't go to the gym more often. <laughs> For me, I think learning how to uh, gracefully exit a mentorship relationship that was not going well is something that I learned slowly over the last two years. It's important to have that skill and think about it as an option during your time here. 
Yeah, I joined the Duke table tennis team pretty late last year, and I would have done that earlier had I known about it. And uh, <laughs> uh, certainly that you came to this event, you already did something right, because <laughs> I missed it, and I regret, regret deeply not being here last year. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> For me, it's just going out and being more social. You only regret those events you didn't go to, so do take advantage of all the great events that are advertised on the Duke Graduate School homepage or in the newsletters you find. I never regretted any event I actually did go to, so... <laughs> yeah.